Never has there been a greater adaptation of a previous IP than Alien Isolation. Well, okay, maybe Gollum takes the top spot. I'll leave that one for you guys to duke out in the comments. Released in 2014, Alien Isolation quickly rose to become one of the greatest horror games ever created. With an immersive and absolutely gorgeous environment to explore, an innovative and terrifying xenomorph AI hunting you at every turn, and Axel. But the question is, does it still hold up 10 years later? Well, I set out to answer this question by finally hunting down the game's platinum trophy. So, without much further ado, welcome to this week's Endorphin Hunt. Let's get into it. For those of you unfamiliar with this game, the story sees us playing as Ellen Ripley's daughter, Amanda, who is seeking answers and closure after the mysterious disappearance of her mother 15 years earlier. When the flight recorder of her mother's ship is located, Amanda is invited along to retrieve it from a space station named Sevastopol. Mission 1 starts us off nice and easy by introducing us to the characters and showing our arrival at Sevastopol. Well, it was easy for me at least, but maybe not so much for Ripley, who found herself being yeeted into space. <coughs> But before all of that, we put ourselves on the board nice and early by earning our first two trophies. A record of disaster for finding our first archive log, a collectible found on these computer terminals throughout the game, and a wake for completing the first mission. And now that we're in the thick of it, there's a couple of things I should probably note about my approach to this hunt. There were three playthrough related trophies that I took note of before I got started. Survivor, Mercy or Prudence, and One Shot. Now you could theoretically get all of these in one playthrough if you were bat crazy enough, which I'm not. So I broke my hunt down into three sections. A first playthrough on hard difficulty in which I didn't kill a single human enemy, a second playthrough with no deaths, and finally the cleanup using mission select. So the footage you're seeing to begin with is me going through my first playthrough. So don't judge me too hard for how many times I die here. It was a lot. because his tail touched me. Mission two introduces us to the core aspects of our gameplay, such as using the maintenance jack to open locked doors, avoiding the human enemies who will most certainly try to infect you with their bullets, and of course, jump scares. I don't know where my feet are. Oh, it doesn't matter where my feet are. Oh, and we meet this handsome fella. Excellent. Along the way, we also add a couple more trophies to our collection. We craft our first item, a process which is absolutely essential to our survival in this game, and earn Build to Survive. And then, just before we grab our maintenance jack, we also grab an ID tag and earn The Missing. Overall, there are 50 of these to find through the space station, so you can bet we'll be returning to those later. But in the meantime, we progress through the story, and Axel finds out what happens when you don't subscribe to the channel. We bid adieu to everyone's second favorite bald man and then move on to finish the mission and earn Welcome to Sevastopol. We kick off mission 3 by finding a door hacky doodah and our first weapon of the game the revolver, which is basically useless in my current playthrough. Normally, the revolver is used to fend off human enemies, but since I'm not allowed to kill any of those and shooting the revolver brings the xenomorph directly to your position to nibble on your giblets, it's not exactly an ideal weapon at the moment. Back to the story, and we progress through to find the missing flight recorder, which unfortunately has been corrupted, unlock the elevator to seek some communications, and get treated to this absolutely iconic moment. <laughs> we 
We end the mission by taking the elevator to communications and unlock A Hunt Begins for Our Troubles. Mission 4 is where the game really starts kicking things up a gear. We're introduced to the Working Joes, AI synthetics whose sole purpose is to make our life as pleasant as possible. by ridding us of the burden of breathing, apparently. Luckily, I'm a big brave boy. So on my first encounter with these murderous machines, I did the only thing I knew how to do. Run away. Are you above me? Oh, hello. Ooh. And you can laugh all you want, but the game rewarded me for doing so with a trophy, not a scratch. So, haha. <laughs> my next encounter, however, wasn't so smooth. You cheeky bastard. Kill an android. Did that. Mm. Ah! Okay, I learned this in Dead by Daylight. Do you guys want to see some looping? It's really cool. You guys ready? You guys ready? You can't go both ways, bro. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you guys want to see something really cool? Come, come look at that. Look at that. Look at that on the floor. There we go. Oh, Macarena! Something amiss? Your mom. Your mom's a miss. Your mom's a miss. Your mom is. It's your mom. <laughs> Eventually, we managed to contact the other members of our crew stuck on the station, Samuels and Taylor, to find their location, end the mission, and unlock You Shouldn't Be There. Which brings us on to a mission that I'm sure needs no introduction for anyone who has played this game before. Mission 5, otherwise known as the f***ing Medical Bay Mission. We start out by learning that Taylor has been injured during our fiasco in Mission 1, and that we need to head to the SciMed Tower to find a medical kit. When we arrive, we meet this lazy sausage who tells us we need a keycard and a passcode to access the elevator. Sounds easy enough, right? Oh, you poor misguided soul. And so begins the nightmare. The Xenomorph is absolutely relentless in this sequence, and with such close quarters to operate in, we find ourselves on the business end of a chump more times than I'd care to admit. And to give you an idea of just how much I suffered here, the previous four missions had taken between 20 and 30 minutes to complete. Mission 5 took me a grand total of 1 hour and 23 minutes. Our goal here switched from trying to reach the end of the mission to just trying to reach the next save point. Eventually, through sheer brute forcing our way through, we found Dr. Morley's keycard and headed back to the Lazy Sausage to watch what is arguably the coolest death scene in the entire game. Very cool. <laughs> and then we finally ended the mission. And the game has the sheer audacity here to award me with how do you feel? Hmm, I wonder. Unfortunately for me, mission six doesn't exactly ease off the throttle as I find myself trapped in this room for the best part of half an hour. Ah! Oh! But on the brighter side, we did manage to at least tick a few more trophies off the list in this mission. First up, we unlock She's in the Vents for using the vent system around Sevastopol for the 20th time. And then, during my stint in the prison of this room, we crafted the best item in the game, the Molotov, and were awarded with a true engineer for crafting every possible item in the game. Not that it helped, of course. Was there a reason? Was there a reason you came into that vent? Was there a reason? There was no reason. You just f***ing appeared. For why? The mission continues our task to find a trauma kit for Taylor, with us creeping past both the xenomorph and human enemies as we scour the hospital wing for what we need. We eventually find it and then are told to head to the medical reception to meet up with Samuels and Taylor once more. But before that, sit back and enjoy what is probably the most pathetic attempt at a fight that you will ever see anyone engage in while playing video games. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to kill this man? I feel like I'm supposed to kill this man. Ah! 
put it away, bro. Listen, listen. I'll stab you with it. I'll stab you with it. I'll f***ing stab you with it. I got a trophy. I'll do it again. You okay? I don't care, but are you okay? What? Okay. I'm just going to need you to... I'm going to need you to... To not... I'm going to need... Oh! Oh, he's, he's slapping me about. Uno Memento. Thank you very much. I have to report your mom for, for being a... All right. So, how about we 0 one 2 one do one I'm going to shoot you in the face. I'm going to... What did I say, bro? What did I say? I handled that fine. <laughs> I handled it fine. <laughs> With the synthetic expertly dispatched, we head deeper into hell. I think he's coming behind me. <laughs> Bro, that was a visceral reaction for me then. Now that, that was that was visceral. <laughs> That was, there was no control over that. That was. <laughs> Escape! Escape! What about the collectibles? Cl climb! Climb! Why are you having, oh, why are you having difficulty with it all of a fucking sudden? It's a ladder. This is a good idea. Whose idea was this? Jump! Right, right. Well, how about how about we don't do that? Well, that wasn't stressful at all. That was fine. I enjoyed that. That was a nice way to spend five minutes. I cannot tell you how excited I was to finally be leaving this freaking medical bay as we escape in the elevator and earn caught in the trap. Elvis has left the building. Thankfully, Mission 7 takes things down a notch and gives us the fairly simple task of fixing an elevator to get back down to Taylor and Samuels, which we do amidst watching a synthetic get turned into a barbecue snack. And honestly, there's not much else to report here, so we make our way to the end and unlock an outpost of progress. We return to find Taylor dangerously close to a brunch date with death, and a security marshal who is pissed that we triggered an earlier trap of his that had been set up for the Xenomorph. We leave the trauma kit with Samuels and set off to fix the transit system so that we can all cozy up away from the prying eyes of the Xenomorph. But before all of that, it's time for a couple more trophies. For hacking through our 10th locked door, we earn Sieg's and Security Bypass. And then when we use the motion tracker to detect our 30th target, we're rewarded with I Admire Its Purity. Gotta say, loving the subtle references in these trophy names. We fix the transit and head to Solomon's habitation tower to meet up with the crew, and more importantly, meet Marlow, the captain of the ship that is responsible for bringing the Xenomorph to Sevastopol. In a bit of a flashback mission, and to be fair the mission in which I was geeking out the hardest, we play as Marlow and see history repeat itself as him and his crew stumble upon a very familiar scene. Are those eggs? Uh, uh... Why, when something opens, do people put their face near it? Ah! I knew it was coming. I knew it was... Yeah. Mm. For this nostalgic trip, we earn ourselves not the first. Back on Sevastopol, the Marshal tells us that he has another plan for us to trap the Xenomorph, and sends us on our way to set it up. Before he does, he leaves us with a parting gift. Yes! Oh, you tasty minx. Come here. Let's hope this thing works. Can I burn you? Are you afraid of fire? It fucking will be. But more on that later. For now, do you remember my challenge in this playthrough to not kill any humans? Well, I quickly found a very creative way to bypass this issue whenever human enemies stood in my way. The only thing is, these guys weren't actually enemies. They were friends. And I horrendously misread the situation and decided to sentence them both to death. 
Yeah, sorry about that. And now I was left with an even bigger problem. The Xenomorph was stood exactly where I needed to be. But I had a flamethrower now. What, bud? What? <laughs> Yo! Wait, wait, what, what, what? what? Right, now we've established who's alpha. Mm. This was my second mistake of this mission. What I didn't realize at the time is that the alien actually becomes more resistant to the flamethrower the more you use it. So all I was doing here with all my pointless bravado was making it harder for myself later on. Yeah, I did say that the AI was infamous for being one of the smartest in gaming, to be fair. What are we saying, huh? Well, most of the time it is anyway. To set up the trap, we need to close off the various exits around the server farm to seal the xenomorph inside. A plan which goes off without a hitch, for the most part. Ah! We briefly get trapped inside the server farm with the beastie until Ricardo lifts the lockdown and lets us out, which the marshal is of course not very happy about. He tells us to head down to Gemini Labs for one more chance, with the warning that we can't let it escape next time, no matter what. Well, I'm sure that's not any type of foreshadowing at all. Oh! Oh, what a bitch. Oh my god, pressurize the airlock? Pressurize the- But there is a- Fuck him. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! I was trying to, to poke the man on the floor. Fuck. Back up! And do not run at me again. What? You are taking more fire than last time. Oh, that is terrifying. This fills me with more fear than anything to do with the alien. During this mission, we also earn Retreat from Fire for yeeting a Molotov at the Xenomorph and rack up a considerable number of deaths to add to the overall tally, which is actually a good thing for reasons I'll explain later on. With the Xenomorph jettisoned into space, the next few missions are a lot more pleasant to work through. In the 11th mission, we make our way back to the safe space while finding out that the Working Joes have now been ordered to hunt down any human knocking about on the ship. Which is fun. Love a good game of hide and seek, me. We also add another weapon to our arsenal, the shotgun, and don't waste any time using it to remodel this android's face and earn Use With Caution. I think my makeover was rather successful if you ask me. We end the mission finding out that the androids have killed everyone except Ricardo, and that Samuels hasn't returned from his trip to the synthetic production wing. So we set out to find him and earn hazard containment for completing the mission. We eventually find Samuels attempting to contact Apollo, the AI system that runs Sevastopol, but it doesn't exactly go well and we have to quickly shut down the power before he blows up the entire station. Which, after 11 missions of similar nonsense, doesn't even make us bat an eye. Unfortunately, Samuels has taken the brunt of this power surge, and gives us one last idea to visit the Apollo Corps to find answers before powering down for good. So, uh, anyone got a phone charger I could borrow for him? We head back to the transit station, earning power games for accessing our 10th rewire point along the way, and then completing the mission to unlock a synthetic solution. Which brings us on to mission 13. We talk to Apollo, find out that scans of the station's central reactor are showing something fishy, and then... Oh, that's the end of the mission. Alrighty then, moving on. We decide to investigate the reactor and find out that when Apollo said there was something fishy going on, they were a bit uninformed about the matter. Oh no. God.
Are you taking a brand? I don't do this yet. <laughs> this is by far the scariest section of the entire game, in my opinion, purely because of these little bastards. Ah! Bro, I didn't even see it. I didn't even see it, it was just there. Oh, you dirty little bastard. Told you, little bastards. Our goal here is to overload the A and B cores in an attempt to eventually destroy the nest, while Xenomorphs and facehuggers roam the halls sniffing for our booty. And somehow, not only do I manage to navigate this entire section without ratting myself, but I also managed to do it without dying a single time, earning watch your step as a result. We also earned a couple more trophies during this mission. For using the final weapon added to our collection, the bolt gun, we're rewarded with this should work. Turns out it only works when you unlock the ability to aim. Then when we make our way back up to the reactor and activate the purge, we complete our 10th mini game and unlock Siegzen Systems Expert. And does that purge actually solve anything? I hear you asking. <laughs> of course not. What we effectively do here is walk into someone's home, murder their children, and then set off a nuke in the middle of their living room. But the someone is about a gazillion xenomorphs who now have nowhere else to be but in the halls of Sevastopol. Whose idea was this? For our excellent decision making abilities, we're rewarded with throwing the switch. Mission 15 sees us chasing Marlo and Taylor to Marlo's ship, the Anisidora, where they have fled to in an attempt to escape the chaos. Which is absolutely fair, to be honest. When we arrive, however, Marlo reveals his plan to us. That'll turn the reactor into a goddamn nuke. You'll destroy the ship and the station. It will annihilate every trace of that creature. Ripley, it's the only way. I can't let it live. And I'm not letting the company have it, or they'll just start the whole thing over again. And is it just me who thinks that he kind of has a point here? Yes, there are people still alive on Sevastopol. But for how long with the androids and xenomorphs on the prowl? And if the Xenomorphs are brought back to civilization, which if we know anything about corporations and their desire for power by any means necessary, they will be, then the human race can basically stick our heads between our legs and kiss our asses goodbye. So yeah, Marlo's got a point, but unfortunately Ripley and Taylor don't agree and try and stop him. Ultimately though, they're too late. Taylor is honestly given a nicer death than most people in this game. Ripley manages to flee back to Sevastopol, and the Anisidora's explosion takes out one of the station's orbital stabilizers. Eh, fun for everyone then. Well, it is for us at least, as we're rewarded with the message for completing the mission. All right, let's keep going with it. Uh, oh yeah, right. So, for some reason, all of my footage for the finale of this game corrupted, which was very frustrating. Luckily, I did complete a second playthrough as part of this challenge, so I can at least use that while I'm walking through what went down in the final missions. And to be fair, it may be a blessing, because the final few missions just largely consisted of me getting very annoyed with the game. I don't know if this was just me, but from the start of mission 16 to the end of the game, the story just really started to drag. It felt like our objectives just became, okay, you need to go and do this. Oh, but here's this ridiculous thing that's suddenly gone wrong that you need to go and fix first. Cool, you've done that, on to the next objective. Oh, but what do you know? Here's another random thing that's gone wrong. Rinse and repeat until Aaron loses his marbles. These missions took me hours because of this structure, which ultimately just felt like pointless padding when it came down to it. But the cliff notes go something like this. Mission 16 sees us starting to try and find a way to escape onto the ship we arrived in, the Torrens. We manually readjust some satellites to allow us to contact them, find out that Ricardo has found a new BFF, and earn transmission for completing the mission. The penultimate mission of this game, number 17, is probably up there with mission 5 for its infamy amongst those who have played this game. While the objective is fairly simple, reach the elevator to the spaceflight terminal, the game forces you to backtrack multiple times in these tiny rooms that also frequently occupy the xenomorph. Making my way through this section on hard mode was an absolute slog, but I eventually did so and earned Free the Torrens. 
We also collected our 100th archive log during this mission and were rewarded with Voices of Sevastopol for doing so. And then we reach mission 18, the final mission of the game. With escape just within our grasp, our only thing left to do is engage the docking clamps on the torrents and head out using the airlock to reach them. Because of course, it couldn't be that easy. We make our way through another nest. Man, these xenomorphs really do be getting right down to business, huh? Head out through the airlock and release the torrents to stop Sevastopol dragging it down to the planet below. And apparently just in time, with us blowing the xenomorphs into space and then successfully landing on the torrents and being awarded end of the hunt. But again, it's just never that easy, is it? In our final act, we blow both of us into space and decide to have a little nap while the game showers us with trophies. For completing the game on any difficulty, we earn Ripley signing off. For doing so on hard difficulty, we're rewarded with Survivor. And then finally, for doing it all without killing a single human enemy, we unlock Mercy or Prudence. Oh, what a game! But it's not over yet as we still have 8 trophies left to unlock before that sweet, sweet platinum. So guys, gals and non-binary pals, let's get cracking. We start off by tackling what is easily the grindiest trophy of the entire game, 100 times too many. This requires you to complete the very simple task of being chomped by the xenomorph 100 times. Luckily, you can use the survival game mode to contribute to this trophy. So I just loaded up the first level and repeatedly ran into Mama Zeno for a big ol' hug. This is where all of those previous failures during my hard mode playthrough actually paid off, because every single one of them reduced the grind that I had to go through now. But that still didn't stop the game taking the opportunity for a quick jab. Try to avoid conflict? <laughs> Oh, I'm just being mocked by the game at this point. And then after 30 minutes of tender, loving affection from the alien, the trophy finally popped. Which means it's time for our next challenge, the one that I had been dreading since the start of my hunt and one in stark contrast with 100 times too many. Completing an entire playthrough without dying a single time. Yes, I'm doing novice, all right? I don't want to hear anything about it in, in the comments. I've already done my hard experience. This is my downtime. This is my spa relaxation experience, okay? I can't go. I can't die. I'm doing it on novice. And if you've got a problem with that, I don't care. I may have been misguided here, but I was feeling strangely confident going into this because I knew that I had a little trick up my sleeve if it came to it but more on that later. The first few missions of the game are actually fairly difficult to die in, so we breezed through them with ease and even earned just out of reach for completing the fourth mission without getting attacked by an android. But then we got to mission five, and as soon as I stepped into that medical bay, my PTSD flashbacks began to kick in. I strapped myself in for another slog through the level, but then we completed it in 10 minutes. <laughs> A stark contrast to the 1 hour and 23 minutes it took me previously, and further evidence as to why I do not ever play games on harder difficulties unless I absolutely have to. And for completing the mission without dying, we were also rewarded with Hide, Run, Survive. And with that hurdle out of the way, we started to barrel through the missions without any real issues, ticking off each one at a nice and steady pace. It was only once I reached the later missions after I'd been playing for a few hours straight without breaks that things really started to get spicy, and I was forced to pull out my secret weapon. Yep, force quitting. What, did you think it was going to be something unique? After a quick nap break, I came back with full force to finish this thing once and for all. But first of all, we had to deal with this guy who said that my mom doesn't peel her bananas before eating them. Hey, self-defense. Not bad, not bad. 
We had a few more scares with some face huggers. I really bloody hate these things. And then we finally came face to face with our final challenge of the run. Yes! <laughs> oh, that right there is the face of absolute peace. Which doesn't make sense, because that wasn't even my last trophy. Chop chop, Aaron, get back to it, lad. With only three trophies left to unlock, I finally turned my attention to the remaining collectibles. In Alien Isolation, there are three different types of collectibles with trophies attached to them. The archive logs found on computer terminals and ones we'd already ticked off, Nostromo logs found mostly in hidden areas of the ship, and ID tags, of which there are 50 to find. And I have to give huge props to the creators of this game here for having the absolutely ingenious idea to have the ID tags a player finds actually save across playthroughs. That meant that every tag I had found across my hard and then my no death playthroughs had all been collated into one collection. And yet it still wasn't actually that many. Still a very cool feature, and as an avid trophy hunter who is frequently hunting collectibles for hours, I would love to see more games do this. Now, these ID tags weren't necessarily hard to find, but they were very tedious. The mission select feature of the game helped, but if you had missed an ID tag at the very end of a mission, you had to play through the entire thing again to get it, which quickly racked up the overall time. Whilst we were hunting these tags, I also made sure to cross the final combat trophy off my list, killing a working Joe with the maintenance jack and nothing else. And then, after a solid few hours of exploring every nook and cranny on Sevastopol, we found our final ID tag and unlocked the Taken, which left just one more trophy to unlock, and one that I had actually specifically left to be the finale of my hunt. For those of you who don't know, I am a huge Alien fan, and the original movie easily ranks in my top 5 horror films of all time. So when I found out that the Nostromo logs were audio files from some of the original characters of the first film, you can bet I was giddy with excitement. And now, with everything else complete, it was finally time to track them all down. There's not much to say regarding the difficulty of finding these, as you can find most of them fairly easily by doing a bit of backtracking and exploring at the start of Mission 16. What I will say though, is that if you are also a fan of the original film, I would highly recommend you try and find every single one of them, as they really are a nice little treat. And so, it wasn't long at all before we reached this moment. It is currently 5 in the morning. I have been playing this game through the night to collect the ID tags and get the logs, which I don't recommend doing by the way. Playing this game in the dead of night is not a fun experience. <laughs> Very terrifying. But this here right in front of us represents the final thing I have to do. All I have to do... Oh, there's a lot of crap here, look. Oh yes, I'm never going to use that, but I'll take it anyway. All we have to do is click X here. This is the last Nostromo log. Let's have it. Archivers. There it is. You know what? It only took me 10 years. 10 years to platinum this game, but I'm so glad I did. It was freaking awesome. What a what an experience. I had my gripes with the story, particularly the pacing. Like there were par there were parts towards the latter half where it just felt like the game really dragged, Ooh, come on, get to the finish line, and it just, it kind of really pulls you along. But overall, the game's incredible, and, and super happy to add this to my Platinum. Thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like, subscribe, and check out some of my other trophy hunts using the card on the screen or the link in the description. Also, let me know if there are any other games you want to see me tackle. I hope you all have a fantastic day, and happy hunting.